Hello and welcome to the Armin Show podcast where things have been improving day by day. We learn more about science, creativity, people, in this case, language. Language is a theme of recent time. And we have two guests here. This is a really cool one. This is a book, co-authors. Let me describe them. We have Morton H. Christensen here. And also, I don't know if I'm pointing it the right direction. And also Nick Cheta here, past guest. Let me do an introduction on both. Morton is William R. Keenan Jr., professor of psychology at Cornell University, as well as professor in cognitive science of language at Aarhus University in Denmark. And he is coming to us from New York. Morton, welcome to this one. Thank you so much. Great to have you. It is a wonderful thing. And also, we have past guest from episode 236, Nick Cheta. He is professor of behavioral science at Warwick university and he wrote the book the mind is flat he is coming to us from the united kingdom nick welcome to this episode well thank you very much yeah in fact specifically oxford is uh, is where i'm coming to you from uh, oh, cool. wonderful oxford i'm a big fan of certain areas hubs of the world that it appears that more intellectual discourse and research is done now you are together co-authors of this book the language game how improvisation created language and changed the world. People always tell me I should showcase it more clearly. That is that right there. Wonderful cover. I always like covers. I also like all the subsections and subheadings that you put into the chapter because that helps me to take notes, which I printed out just to showcase. I take notes on books. I just want to put that out there. Uh, notes are a good thing. Now, before we get into the book, how did you to uh, get to know of each other? And then we'll go into the research, but Whoever would like to start, how would you? How did you two meet each other in the first place? Do you want to kick off, Morton? Yeah, so we we met each other at Edinburgh University uh, over thirty years ago now, and um, we met in a in a sort of weekly workshop on connectionist modeling, that is using artificial neural network to understand cognition and language, and we hit it up right away and we've been working together since then so our first paper came out in 1992 and we've been friends and collaborators since then with several books many many articles and chapters and papers and and we just really really enjoy working together yeah and most of that time we've been in different continents so we had the period when we were graduate students and around that time when we were actually both in in edinburgh but after that um what moved to the us and i've stayed in the uk so um, it's sort of an amazing thing, really, that we've kept going you know, nearly three decades of work where we've been just shuttling back from one, one continent to the next. And obviously, these days, also, we can talk more easily by, by Zoom. But I mean, it's, you know, it's kind of an amazing thing, but it's been tremendous. It's been one of the most exciting things in my academic career to be uh, working with Morton. It's been just great. So um, yeah, hopefully that comes through in the book. That's the idea. Yeah, and, and whenever we are together, it's always sort of, it's like an intellectual holiday so we we come up with new ideas that so we could get a we come away from it sort of refreshed and sort of enlivened by new ideas and new ways of thinking about language cognition culture and so on it's a delightful item and the people we are with for a long time is like a partial portion of us in a way without them we would not be our full self now morton i would like to start with uh, describing your research a bit, you do research evolution of language and connectionist modeling of human language acquisition. How would you describe the subcategory you've gone into at this point, and why are you there? Um, I'm always been interested in learning and different aspects of of language learning, uh, both you know children, but also more recently, I'm also moving into how we learn second languages as well, how we pick up a foreign language, but. But I've also realized, and this is through the work with Nick, that um, in order to understand how language acquisition works, we actually need to approach it from an evolutionary perspective as well. So, so in a sense, I've been trying to understand how language evolves and changes across multiple timescales, the timescales in which we are using it, like we're doing right now when we are talking together, so the timescale of the millisecond, the timescale of decades when we are acquiring language from 
those around us. And then, of course, the timescales of millennia when language themselves have evolved and changed over time. And part of the work that I've been doing is sort of trying to understand the interconnection between these different timescales. And, and it's something that, that we've been working a lot on together. And it's been just fantastic. And uh, in doing that, we sort of come up with a number of new ideas about how language works, which we both think is very exciting. This is a cool thing. Without language, we would have no mode of communication. And it's the only way that's propelled us forward as compared with other organisms out there. Now, Nick, your work is on rationality and language using a range of theoretical and experimental approaches. Where is your current subcategory of research today and why in that direction? Yeah, yeah. So, well, I mean, I, I do a variety of things, but the the a lot of my work is about um, uh, I'm trying to understand the sort of interface between rationality and communication. And as you've just pointed out, these are, these are very closely linked because obviously without the ability to articulate our ideas, we would not have any rational thoughts or debates about anything very much, uh, which isn't to say that some human intelligence is not preserved when you, when you lose language. Um, and in this particular context, I think the thing that I suppose I'm most uh, focused on is the sort of charades element of the book. So one of the things we'll talk about later is the idea that that uh, although charades is a game you play without language, actually, even when you're using language, it's sort of mostly charades, but just a few linguistic clues. So I've been very interested in that idea in working with Morton and sort of connected to that, but but a slightly different strand is working with um, Jennifer Misiak, who's a former PhD student of Morton. So there's a lot of connections here. Uh, so Jennifer and I have done about seven or eight years work on uh, trying to understand um, essentially ad hoc, sort of charade-like communication, but using quite abstract games. So using games where you're just sort of hiding things under buckets and putting little little blobs on top of the buckets and thinking, well, what does that mean? Does that mean I should search there? Or does it mean definitely don't search there, whatever you're doing? So it's um, so it's a kind of experimental uh, and to some extent theoretical um, look at the sort of charade-like behavior we're talking about in the book. I noticed this theme across the book that charades as pronounced there or charades. Either or charades, way. yes. <laughs> I, I say charades. Yeah. <laughs> I won't be able to correct that, sorry. Is there a theme underneath there that we are doing a form of um, figuring out of one another's items? How would one describe it? And so we'll, I guess we could go to that at first because that is a large theme in there. Uh, how would you describe how we communicate? Is it um, very direct and planned, or is it that we aim to figure each other out along the way? How does language work? Uh, and I would go to Morton in this case. So, and anyone can jump in, by the way, I'm just So, so the idea of the race is that we try to come up with various kinds of clues in the moment in order to kind of get the idea across that we're trying to uh, uh, mimic in some way or another. And so the idea is that for language two, much of what we do is really provides diff different kinds of verbal clues, but actually a lot of the work is done by the listener uh, who is using their knowledge of, you know, things we talked about before, what they know about you, what we know about the world and so on. And all of that knowledge come into play in order to make sense of what's actually being said. So in some sense, and this is one of the things we are suggesting in the book is that language is really just the tip of a communication iceberg. And underneath that, and this is what allow us to play sort of linguistic charades are things like cultural norms, conventions, what we know about the world, um, how we're able to interrelate to one another. And that really what makes language possible in the first place. Without, without this, the submerged part of the communication iceberg, you know, linguistic communication would sort of sink into the abyss and we would not be able to communicate. Yeah, and just to add, to add to a concrete example to that. So if you think about uh, everyday words like um, he and she and it. Um, these are words that refer back to something we've been talking about, or maybe something salient in the situation. So you, you could say, you look out the window and say, oh, uh, he looks a bit wet if it's a rainy day. And who's he? Well, presumably some person we can both see. But if it's if I can see them and you can't see them, then I can't use he in that context. It's just kind of, you know, what am I talking about? Uh, it's just silly. Um, but on the other hand, we can use those we can use those words to refer to somebody we were talking about a moment ago, um, or or it could be that we say we're using a name. Um, so if I refer to 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 to, 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 to Mary or uh, Anita or whoever it is, um, then this will. So in the case of Anita with Morton, this is going to have a particular meaning because that's that's a, Morton's wife. 
um, then you know it's clearly that I'm clearly referring to a particular person. We know that because because we know each other very well. But but, but if I'm talking to somebody else, I, I'd have to explain who that person was, or I might be talking about something totally different to Nita. So there's always this work being done by the listener and by the speaker, thinking, well, given what we know together. If I use this word, or it could be a gesture or a nod, what does it mean? I mean, what's the other person going to make of it, given given what we know, what we've just been talking about, where we've, where we've just been? And so that sort of people in language sciences have always thought this with regard to things like um, pronouns and, and uh, didactic expressions, pointing expressions like that and this. But they haven't, and, and to some extent, they thought about they thought, it, they thought it about other aspects of language too. Um, but I suppose we're just generalizing that and saying, well, just to understand anything anybody says, it's almost all of the work is this is this kind of contextual figuring out. Um, and of course, in charade, that's especially true because you're taking the language away and you're forcing people to do crazy minds. Um, but really, you know, language is, is, is all, the, all the hard work's being done by the, um, by, 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 by the background knowledge of, of the speaker and the listener and that sort of shared understanding. I like the fact that during the book, it makes me remember things about language that we forget about. We probably forgot about if you're, uh, let's say, 40, maybe 30 years ago, because you have early elements that you had to figure out a uh, piece together. And now you just take it into account that we are communicating. But uh, I'm trying to figure out what that person's saying. We're having shared words that we use regularly. If we didn't use these words, there'd be a huge gap between us. And we might uh, serve to cobble together a new language, which is one message that is brought up here. How is language cobbled together? Is English a cobbled form of something from the past that adapted to today? How would you describe that? Yeah, well, I can, I, I can start with a couple of thoughts on that. I mean, I think the cobbling process is always going on. Um, so each of us is somehow cobbling together um, our own way of using language and our own specific um, use of language in a particular conversation in the moment based on the, the various um, things we've heard and said before. But also um, this, this process of cobbling together is also going on when languages begin. So, um, so, so for example, when groups of people such as um, Captain Cook in the house, so this is an example we talk about in the book, that Captain Cook and his, his crew arrive uh, at the Chair del Fuego and they have to go and speak, as they say, to the, 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 the people who, who live there. But of course, they have no common language, but they're able, in fact, to communicate quite effectively. Um, and the, the kind of the, the, the example uh, they, 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 they document is that um, they, the group, group of landers stand on the beach and then two of them venture out and two of the house venture out in a kind of slight presumably with some trepidation. And then the house have big sticks which they throw aside and the throwing aside of the sticks is interpreted and this in fact turns out to be correct to say, as, as saying, you know, we're not threatening you, don't worry. Um, and pretty soon they're on the uh, house on board ship and they're uh, trying food and drink and not liking it very much and swapping goods. And so there's all kinds of productive uh, interchange occurring. Uh, Eve, and, and, that, and that requires a lot of, essentially a lot of charade playing. But, um, but of course that's, that's being done uh, with really, really little in the way of the, uh, the communicative iceberg that Morton was talking about. I mean, like, we're, 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 the common humanity and common understanding of you know, basic human needs, the kind of things people are likely to communicate, that's, that's common. Um, but what's really, really astounding about this kind of case is that um, the, 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 the worldviews and the backgrounds of the people involved are really different and they can still communicate. But of course, if you put people in that situation for long periods, then, language, then conventions start to accumulate and a language, a, language, a common language will start to emerge, initially a very simple one, but that rapidly gets more complicated. So even so, so in, in any situation where you, you, you put people in a situation where they haven't got um, a common language, they'll cobble something together pretty fast and give them enough, give them a few generations and it'll be a rich, a rich, a rich thing, a bit like languages that you know, we're, we're familiar with. And in fact, if you if you look at English, English is actually an amalgam of many different uh, uh, kinds of languages. So there's a huge influence of Norse, for example, which is close to my heart because I'm Danish. Um, and so, for example, part of the reason why English has relatively simple morphology, so there's very few markings on verbs and nouns and so on in English, uh, is, is due to the influence of uh, Old Norse on English uh, itself. But, but, but I think in a, a key sort of 
point of the book is sort of the that language is fundamentally collaborative and interactive in nature and and it and it may seem sort of fairly straightforward when we think about language we think about language that we use for communication but actually within the language sciences the way language has been studied is often as monologue rather than dialogue so many many experiments are about somebody sitting on their own just listening to stuff or saying stuff but there's rel relatively little interaction going on so part of the contribution of the book is sort of to highlight again the fact that language is for communication and once we start taking that into account we can see that this notion of language as charades provide new insights into uh, language evolution language acquisition and language use that theme of the moment is a wonderful one in the book such that if you look at things from a far away time scale or what happens over a decade you can't tell of what's happening right at each decision making moment which language is that and also the dialogue versus monologue monologue is just an example of it being used but dialogue is the pairing the venn diagram with two people doing that or three or ten so then you can get actual functional nature out of it versus just uh, maybe an idealization or what it could be in some like dictionary type form that's a nice uh, comparison there yeah just why i added that um and i think the um the the, the thing that the, from our perspective you can't really understand monologue without understanding dialogue first so supposing i'm saying to you oh could you pass me the cup um you might think well cup has a meaning and pass has a meaning and there it is right and so that's that's a good example so that is something that's very uncup like in my in, in terms of a prototypical cup so you've just shown me a what looks more like a, a, a water beaker or something i don't know what that's called um but in the context of this you know, we're looking for a receptacle with some liquid in it that you drink then that that's that that um, beaker-like thing um, canister is is a cup. Right? That's that's fine. Um, and similarly, you know, you know, if but if we had something that looked like a teacup in the in the room with us, that if I say, oh, the cup, um, you'd you'd pass me the teacup because you, that's something that look more pre prototypical would would dominate. But equally, if I was obviously wanting to to drink, um, and the, and I, and the one cup is your cup. Then obviously you wouldn't pass me your cup. But obviously you don't mean that one. That's my cup. I've just been drinking out of it. You mean this one. So the, the, even something as trivial as you know what, what are we referring to when we're talking about the cup, that that's it has to be decided in the moment. And even the boundaries of what a cup is. I mean, what you know, people have, have kind of historically thought cup. There's a sort of concept of cup. I wonder what's in the concept and what's not in the concept, as if this is kind of a metaphysical thing. Whereas our perspective would be, and I, and I think it's not not by any means just us. That you have to think about the individual situation and in the particular situation we're in the you know, the container you just showed me is a cup that's fine and we both understand it we're going to see it that way for now for this situation but there are plenty of other situations in which it isn't and thinking oh but, but but what's the real truth you know how does language work in the abstract don't worry about these particular dialogues just in the abstract what does it mean and the answer is well nothing really it, it just doesn't that's the primary function of language is is, is dialogue so if you abstract away the the interaction then you kind of don't have anything left this is a great one this makes me think of how they say a boat is great in harbor but that's not what they're built for it can stay clean and never have damage but the whole purpose of it is transport or taking you there or whatnot so if you're not using for that it doesn't matter how clean or long it lasts now you've just turned it into like a residence that's not what it's set up for language is a functional yeah, very nice example yeah in the moment I like these, they help me uh, put things in togetherness. Now, one thing that comes to mind is there's a somewhat of a theme of language and how it relates to us as people. Would you describe it as a layer on top of us or, because there's alternate views on this, but yeah, is it a layer on top of us that we built over time or is it something somehow functionally already part of us? How would you speak on that? So I think that that's an interesting question. So in some sense, language allows us to do much more than we could do without language. So once we sort of get the idea of language, and this is probably a very slow and very gradual process, and very likely language might have evolved separately in separate groups of early humans uh, several times, but then once you get language suddenly everything changes and we can start 
negotiating how we want to do things, how we want to go for a hunt. We can negotiate. I can borrow something from you. I can express it in a much more easy way than if I was just taking it from you and you figure out why are you taking this from me? But I can, can I just borrow this from you? And so by having language that completely changes how we can interact. And it also allows us to build up further ways of interacting. So this is how we can get society, we can get laws, organizations, and so on. So without language, we couldn't really do this. So in a sense, it is building on top of our brains. It is an, an our ways of interacting. But once we get that, it changes also what it means to be human, because now we have this amazing ability to communicate and to build up systems that can allow us to even develop further. On one note about that, what is it about humans, this is pulling back a bit, that makes us able to use language and left all other organisms unable to use it in the way that we do it, what separated us? Well, I mean, to, to start that off, I think it's worth saying what the, the received wisdom has been for, I guess, half a century or slightly more, um, which is, I think, very different from the perspective we're putting forward. I think also different from the sort of current um, the current zeitgeist, really. The received view would be that the thing that makes people different, and this would go back to Chomsky and also Stephen Pinker's famous um, The Language Instinct book, um, the, the, the received view would be that there's something biologically different about people. So people have, humans have um, genes and ultimately brains which have different um, capacities than other animals. In particular, those capacities are supposed to include a sort of abstract knowledge of syntax. Um, so the, the basic so blueprint of language is the, uni the use of universal grammar, which is presumed to be the same across all of the world's languages, although we might come back to whether that's right. Um, that, that's supposed to be built into us, and it's just not built into any other animal. So, so chimps, they're never going to learn, uh, le learn English or any other natural language because they just don't have this universal grammar. So it's viewed there as this kind of abstract, syntactic, almost mathematical structure that we have, but other animals don't. Um, but our perspective would be very different. Uh, so I think our feeling would be that the thing that's remarkable about people is that especially deep abilities to, to understand each other and to share an understanding. So it's a, if, if language is a fundamentally collaborative activity, so that I'm trying to use, give you some clues, and you're, I'm hoping that you're going to interpret your clues in the same way that I'm interpreting them, and we've got to collaborate together to say, you know, what is this thing a cup, and who is that he, who, who is he in this context, and do it, do it in the way that aligns us, and co co coordinates our thinking. Um, to do that, we have to be this amazing sort of deep, deep, deeply social creatures um, who are very tuned in, not just to, to understanding each other, um, but also to, to working together and thinking in, 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 in sort of unified fashion. So I think that's part of the story. It's the from our perspective, it's the underlying um, non-linguistic machinery, but which, which in humans is either qualitatively different or at least quantitatively, you know, an outlier among other species. We're just much more sort of deeply, deeply social, social machines than, uh, than other animals. You might want to add to that more than I have a feeling. Mm -hmm. Nope, happy. And, and yes, in fact, the, this notion of universal grammar has even been called, you know, a language instinct or a language organ. So but the idea is that there's something special biolo uh, biologically specific for language. But instead, what we are suggesting is that that language itself changes and changes and become a more and more complex, more and more useful system for us over time. So whereas uh, people traditionally have been asking, how come the brain is so well adapted for language, we kind of turn that question upside down and ask how come language is so well adapted to be used by us, given our brains, given the way in which we can interact with one another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to, I mean, the, the, the key sort of insight that leads you to is to realize that the reason that language is so connected to us, so well, but well adapted to us, is because it is the product of evolution, but not biological evolution, but cultural evolution. So, I mean, the linguistic forms we use are the forms we use because they're easy to learn, they're useful, uh, they're easy to process, our brains find them easy to work with. So, and we find them, if, if it's speech, we find it easy to say, we find it easy to hear, um, similarly with gestures. So, the, the, the constraints are coming from uh, human interactions across generations of people and the ways the communicative tricks, as it were, the clues that, 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 that we find helpful and uh, uh, allow us to communicate effectively, those are the ones we keep using. So we, the human interaction is a kind of powerful um, selectional pressure 
on the development of language. Uh, so it's so the, so the outcome of language is it's it's like a like any other um, you know, complicated tool or human technology. It's it's built around us because because um, we we you know, we built it. We didn't build it intentionally, um, but we built it implicitly through these you know generations of use. It's like in when they. And in fact, Darwin even sort of kind of foresaw this. So of course, Darwin is mostly known for his work on biological evolution of the origin of species and so on. But actually in The Descent of Man, he talks about uh, how language itself can be looked at as a system that undergoes uh, evolution, uh, natural selection in, in a very same way as, as her, what he has described for uh, organisms. So a, a useful metaphor we talk about in the book too is thinking about languages themselves as akin to organisms that have to be adapted over time to better fit into a particular niche that is our brains and uh, the way we interact with one another. So there's a lot of pressure on languages to be more useful for us and to be more learnable by us. And that's why we suggest that over time, we end up with these quite complex communication systems that we think of as language, but without actually having to build into our brains uh, structures or having genes that are specifically geared towards giving us language. I like this description of the cultural versus the biological adaptation that languages do and the pace of it. That message was wonderful because um, you would describe that because language uh, updates and evolves much more quickly than our DNA or whatnot, uh, it adapts to us because the faster item adapts to the slower item. And it made me think of many different analogies, like if you're snowboarding the mountains, the fast person will always avoid the people who are slow and not experienced because they have the ability. Or same thing when you walk on the street, the person who's faster, uh, they usually walk more around other people to adjust to those that are not. So there's a common theme for forever that the item that's not doing as much uh, is adapted to by the item that can and is already in flow and whatnot. That concept is wonderful. Can you speak on that concept? Yeah, I think I think that's, those are very nice examples. Yeah, I mean, yes, the, the traditional um, that well, the idea that say that Steve Pinker has in the language instinct is this idea that there's a there's not just a biological organ instincts which is special to language but this has evolved through natural selection and you might think well of course it's evolved through natural selection where else does it come from and and pinker is absolutely say, say, say yes that's right if it's if it's a biological organ it must have come through natural selection but actually many people in the um in, in, in who are pro promote the idea of some kind of language organ or universal grammar are pretty skeptical about that they kind of don't like the natural selection story um, so they have to have to have some other rather peculiar story about where it's come from but anyway we won't go into that uh, but i think if you're going down that that line if you're going to believe in a language instinct i think you're absolutely it's absolutely the right thing to think well how, you know, how, how would this how would this biological system have evolved and as you say this creates this deep puzzle because biological systems um, this system is supposed to have evolved to help us speak languages, um, but the, uh, but but at the same time, of course, languages themselves are evolving culturally um, to be as easy to and useful, uh, easy to learn and use, and, and as useful to us as possible. And so you've got these two systems: the fast system and the slow system. The slow system being the um, supposedly the uh, according to Pinker the, um, uh, the the biological system which is specific to language, and then the fast system is. Is the language languages of the world themselves, which are changing so very fast, and even even in a, you know, a century or two, languages can go undergo incredibly fast, rapid changes and the big changes. Um, and so the classic story, and it's a clever, very clever story by um, Stephen Pinker and Paul Bloom, is that there's a there could be a process of sort of co-evolution between these two systems, um, so that but that they can kind of move together. So you start off with a little bit of language, but then your brain starts to become biologically evolved to use that language better. And then your language might evolve a bit more and then the brain will become a bit more evolved too. So the, the, the idea with these fast slow systems are, um, are somehow helping each other forward. And this is a, an idea based on a notion called the Baldwin effect, which is um, much talked about in evolutionary theory uh, from time to time. But um, the, the problem with this, exactly as you, you were pointing out, Armin, is that if you've got two systems one of which changes quickly, one of which changes slowly, then the way the evolutionary dynamics actually works, is it just like your skiers, is that the fast system um, adapts rapidly to the slow system and the slow system just sits there doing nothing. Um, so the biology just doesn't do any evolving. 
Um, so that so there's something sort of fundamentally misguided about this. We've done you know, computer simulations of this to to to, to explore it, but it, you just can't get that that um, that co-evolutionary story to work. So you have to have a story in which you say, well, once cultural change starts to, to run run quickly, then you can't build in um, you can't build in language specific um, knowledge. You just can't you can't do that biologically through evolution um, post hoc. And there are other reasons too. I, 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 we have various arguments about this, but one the very obvious one is that if there is this co-evolutionary process where our brains adapt to our language in a kind of mutual way, then once human societies have split and you know, human, human societies have split many times over very long periods of time. So we haven't, you know, it's not that we had one society all living in you know, a single village for millions of years, you know, people have been distributed across Africa and across the world. Once you have splits, then you're going to get different um, languages, clearly, because they change so fast. And then you're going to get different biologies associated with those different languages. And then you're going to have the problem that people in those different regions won't be able to learn each other's languages because their brains have adapted to different linguistic environments. And that is just, uh, just not true. Um, so if you, just, if, you, if you take someone from any part of the world and plop them in as a baby into any other part of the world, speaking any language at all, they're absolutely fine. There's no, no sign whatever um, of, uh, of this phenomenon. So that's another reason why this kind of co-evolutionary story doesn't really seem to make, make sense. Just to bring the point a little further home. So if you, if you look at just some, some numbers, so it took about you know, seven, 8,000 years uh, for languages as diverse as Danish, Waziri, uh, Persian, uh, Hindi to evolve from a common uh, Proto-Indo-European ancestor. Whereas uh, when we look at human evolution, we can see it took, you know, hundreds of thousands and millions of years sometimes for changes to the homo lineage to emerge uh, into sort of the modern humans that we have today. So there's a huge, difference in terms of the time scale of change. And, and so what happens is that the, the, the cultural product language in this case ends up being a moving target for genetic evolution. And so whenever you end up, so if you fix uh, on a particular kind of language, then the, the language of the community is actually moved on. And then you are sort of set for the wrong language. And that will of course be a problem along the lines of what Nick was suggesting. Lack of adaptation. Is a huge limitation. I've seen many quotes about like adaptation linked to our successfulness. You just can't, the moment changes. And if you're not for that, you're like a hammer with no nail, the analogy broken, but you wouldn't be ready for that moment. One question is if the universal grammar concept is not fitting, is it like, um, are you bringing a large counter force at this time to the past thinking, or is this now a shift in how the thinking is happening? Uh, how would you describe is it more mm. that you're in a smaller percentage of linguists speaking this way or it is now the new thinking it's a very it's a very good question i think there's it depends which part of the um the language sciences you're in really um so i think in our in our world um of people primarily coming from a, a sort of cognitive science perspective so sort of interdisciplinary computationally oriented approach to to language i think we would think we would find most, you know, this is the kind of view, not, not necessarily the details of our view, but the kind, this kind of approach, which is um, doubting the validity of the universal grammar idea and, and thinking of language as something that's um, evolved around us. I think that would be a relatively, um, a relatively commonly held view, probably perhaps even a majority view. Um, but on the other hand, if you moved into certain parts, certain linguistics departments in certain locations, um, then you, you'd absolutely get a strong, strong, um, Blast from what we'd say is a sort of blast from the past that ideas of, of universal grammar are still um, still are still alive and well. So it's not that the debates are sort of all finished, um, but I think I mean. So what the book is trying to do is to is we're still trying to make the case this is the right way to see things and to and to and to explain how that can work. So it's not just saying you know, language is a cultural product um, rather than a biological product. That's that's I think we think right, but that's that's not really the exciting point, point of the book. The point is, well, how does that happen? How does, that, how does this process of creating charades, which then become more and more conventionalized, more standardized, and eventually turn into reusable uh, entities, which we can build on and recombine? How does that, how do we create a language out of this, um, uh, this the, the, out of these moment by moment interactions? So we're trying to tell a story about how languages come to be, which is a very different story from the standard story. But I think, I mean, I would see, see us as, 
we we are part of a larger movement, I guess. Um, we're trying to we're trying to sort of um, push that movement forwards and also direct it in a particular direction. But I think, um, yeah, it's not it's not a maverick position. I don't know what what's your take on this, Martin? Uh, I mean, I think it's definitely the case that, uh, that there's still you know a number of proponents of universal grammar or something akin to universal grammar. So there's a lot of people have a hard time giving up on this notion that there is something specifically biological in our brains just for language. And whether people want to call it universal grammar or something else, it still seems something that people can't quite sort of uh, give up as of yet. On the other hand, over the last several decades, as, as we've learned more about how children acquire language, the information that's available to them in you know, what we say to children. And as we've learned more about just how much variation there is in languages across the world, the notion of this universal grammar that is meant to capture everything there is about language and all languages, that seems to be no longer holding water uh, as much as it used to. It, used, it, it made sense when it was first proposed about 50 to 60 years ago. The, back then, we didn't know, or well, we weren't around then, I suppose, but uh, the people at the time didn't know how kids acquire language. Uh, there was not a lot of data on it. There was not a lot of data of the kind of things that we say to children, so what's known as child-directed speech. And there was very little was even thought about language evolution and so on. So, so all these things were unknown at the time. So it kind of made sense at that time. However, as we now are learning more and more about how language work, how language acquisition differs in different parts of the world, um, how languages have a huge variety of ways in which we can signal differences in meaning or ways in which we want to communicate. Now we begin to see that that old idea of universal grammar just really doesn't work anymore. And, and we are sort of trying to help push an alternative way of looking at it, trying to account for all the things that universal grammar is meant to account for, but in a new way that doesn't require it. And in, in ways that sort of fits with the huge linguistic diversity that we see with the way in which we're looking at child language acquisition and the new ideas that have come out about the cultural evolution of language. Yeah, and just to add, add a couple of thoughts on the ways in which we're trying to explain things that the universal grammar view seem to be necessary for. I mean, one would be that the fact that um, language has got patterns in it at all. So you, know, you might say, well, this is very strange. I mean, language seems to have all this structure, all these um, trees that syntacticians write down and things have syntactic categories. And you know, where's all this stuff coming from? It, nothing else in the natural world seems to have these properties. So it must be, maybe it's something to do with our brains, um, having some, some innate, innate grammar built into them. And, and, our, and our sort of take on that would be actually, you should see the patterns in language which are actually very patchy. So the thing about language is it's, it's this fascinating mixture of regularities, sub regularities and exceptions. And the universal grammar perspective has always been to say, well, let's focus on the regularities and just all the other things we can just put to one side. And that just kind of noise and kind of have to be dealt with specially or separately, but we just really want to focus on regularities. And, that's, and, the, and the idea was to try to build a kind of system, a deep it's systematic single but sort of um, blueprint of, of not just one language, but of essentially all languages using these very deep, deep principles. And, and our take, as we've already indicated, would be that to go the opposite way and to think of the, the process of pattern formation in, in, in language as being much more a process of self-organization. So it's the over long periods of interaction, interacting with each other and reusing things we've said before and recombining, all new patterns and structures start to emerge. And and then they compete with each other. And you know, if I you say something one way, I might think, oh, I could change that a little way, and then you'll see what I mean. So I can you know, use similarities with, with, with things I've said before. Um, and this, this, whole, this whole process is going to lead to uh, orders that start, start to appear, um, but, but in a partial way. There'll always be exceptions. There'll always be um, chaos, because this is sort of order emerging out of chaos rather than a kind of order of being, being um, sort of uh, uh, imposed top down and, and this is a very much a you know it's a very much a santa fe way of looking at the world so i mean morton spent uh, a long period of the santa fe fellow um so santa fe institute of course you can talk about this a bit more fluid than fluidly than i can Morton, but it's it's really the you know it's the home of um, self-organization and complexity theory but that mi mindset is very much sort of at the core of what we're we're saying that's that's where the order comes from it's you know the order is coming from self-organization rather than um, from 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 a top-down um, the planet plan in the brain and the, the other thing 
um, is thinking again about the question of acquisition. The, the puzzle that, that people like Chomsky were very concerned about was how on earth can children learn this the complex grammar of a language from fi a finite number of rather noisy examples? So they only hear a finite number of things and people make lots of mistakes and errors and, and they somehow mysteriously learn this, 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 this incredibly complicated grammar. It seems like if you think about it as a sort of um, a scientific problem, how do you theorize the correct grammar from this scrappy data? It seems hopeless. But what we've discovered I mean, collectively, is uh, not us uh, personally, particularly. Uh, what what has been discovered in the field is that children are not really learning languages like that. They're learning in a much more item-based way. So they're learning little snippets of language, words, phrases, constructions, and they're learning how to recombine and put these together. So they're not really learning this big uh, underlying um, sort of uh, blueprint at all. In fact, there is no blueprint, and that's learning pieces. But if you learn the pieces. Again, the process of spontaneous order starts to uh, occur, and you, you start to build a system which um, which has uh, pans and uh, has lots of lots of um, regularities and sub regularities and exceptions. Uh, but that's being created afresh each each generation by by each new child. But it's not but it's not a kind of mysterious um, process of theorizing. It's a process of learning a skill. So one of the things that we're very keen on is the idea you, we should think of language as a, as a skill that we're learning. And you learn that skill through doing it, through engaging in interaction. Um, whereas I suppose traditionally the language sciences have tended to view language learning as a kind of theoretical project that the, 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 the child is sort of sitting about hearing words flowing by and thinking, mm, I must revise my theory of how language is. I must you know, adjust this grammar rule or that. Whereas really it's not, you, know, it's, you should think we should think of it as much more a, 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 a sort of instance-based, case-based, moment-by-moment um, process where you're trying to deal with a particular challenge in front of you with the particular resource you've got available. And the patterns and the structures are kind of side effects of that. Yeah, and in fact, the, the, yeah, this traditional view of language acquisition is as if the child is kind of like a mini linguist sort of sitting in the crib trying to figure out how the language works. So clearly, you know, of course, it, it's uh, exaggerated here, but the, the idea is that theoretically, that's actually what's going on. And interestingly, it's not just children that they use these sort of uh, reuse sort of chunks of multi-word combinations like I don't know, I like this, and so on and so forth, but at adults too. So there's a number of, of sort of analysis from computational linguistics and also from uh, psycholinguistics that have shown that that up to about 50% of everything we ever say, as adults even, are made up of essentially little prefabs uh, little sort of reuse of little chunks of language that we keep on sort of bringing up and use again and again. Um, and so that kind of changes the whole like, idea that if you if you have all these prefabs, then you don't need a universal grammar because you don't need all the underlying structure because you can get by with these prefabs. You can keep on putting together in new ways and in the way that children do, but also that we see that adults do as well. A lot of great points have been brought up here. I wrote some notes on them. One, you mentioned the Santa Fe Institute. That's why I brought up Scale by Jeffrey West. And I think of a lot of the Santa Fe individuals. I always like the multidisciplinary connection between different topics. That That's my way of thinking like a network. So I like that concept. And then one thing I want to go to is um, the words, all the little elements and how as we adapt, we make things simpler or better. But how is it that we keep doing that and then they get large again through maybe combinations or whatnot and then become simpler or better? And how do things like Chinese language exist where they had maybe 50,000 characters or something, a lot of complexity or other languages with a lot going on. How did it not get simplified 500 years ago or something such that we are just at the ideal points? Can you speak on that concept? Well, I'll start off with a big question. Um, but I mean, the, gen the general point is that languages are continually in flux. And then, but they're not they're not sort of wandering aimlessly in in, um, in the space of all possible languages. So I think uh, uh, one might intuitively think, well, of course, languages change, but they don't change in any particular direction. They just sort of just change, you know, just a, in a sort of um, uh, sort of rather arbitrary fashion. Um, but that's not right. It turns out it says that they change in very specific ways, and this also seems to have a weird consequence. So, for example, the kind of, you get some erosion. So things like verb endings tend to get lost gradually case endings tend to get lost. So morphology generally, uh, that tends to get, get, get lost, gets eroded away. And also words will get shorter. So things get abbreviated, they don't get extended. No one, no one thinks, 
uh, we've got the word kid let's like let's extend that a bit so we can talk about children um, that would be really weird uh, but we do the opposite right? we make we make uh, words um we make them shorter and easier to say and so on um, and, and at the same time of course you have other processes like fusion of words so you, you'll get um you know things like the, the future tense um in, in some languages in romance languages you get the future tenses um comes from a, a, a verb to have so it's like um something like to sing i have i have to sing them because sing later i have to do it um but now then, then it becomes you know to sing i have and then that the, the have then attaches to the sing and then we have a verb ending so you get this kind of um fusion of words and that again is, a, is not a reversible process you don't get words but you don't get languages where the morphology breaks off and starts moving you know, living an independent life so you might think and this very much follows your line of thinking you might think well in that case um are languages convert going in some particular direction or are they you know like what why 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 is there any why is there any um you know why are there any independent words why haven't they all glommed together or um you know why why do we continually have you know this, this these kind of processes and the answer is that at the same time as things, as things are eroding, um, then new, new words are being created to fix the, the ambiguities when you start to erode. So if you erode your verb endings, you need to somehow signal the thing the verb ending told you about. So then you start to put that in explicitly. So for example, if, if verb endings tell you whether you're dealing with I, you, or we, or he, or whatever, then if you've lost your verb ending, then you better introduce an I, or a we, or a who, a, a he, or a she. But then if you do that, then before you know it, that might start becoming, um, that might at some later stage, um, become something that attaches to the a word and is, becomes a new verb ending, um, and then is eroded again. So you're continually, as it were, um, you've got a continual process of, of things like erosion and, and fusion, but at the same time, new things are being, new, new items are continually being created and then eroded and fused. So there's a kind of turnover. So at a local level, at the level of individual words, it's a one direction street, it's a one way street, but on the other hand, at the level of the whole language, it needn't necessarily be. Now, the, the, the wider question of well, why do we why do we have you know, the, the, the linguistic patterns we do say in English, um, and if, you know, why why do we have this particular balance? Why do we have the, you know, a particularly simple morphology? Say, and I think the, from a functional point of view, there's probably no no real answer to that because precisely because as you were hinting, languages are so different. Um, so it seems like there are lots of ways to skin the sort of communicative cat. And there's no particular, if, there were, if, 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 if this were, if there were a very strong selection of pressure um, that advantaged one way of doing it rather than another. So for example, if it were the case that it was really useful to have morphological complexity, so you could pack very long, long sentences into a single word. If that was just a winning strategy, then languages would just all do that. Some of them do, uh, it's fine, it works really well, but, but equally some of them don't. So it, there's no, it doesn't seem, there's a huge space of good solutions in the world of languages. And, the, the, the amazing thing is just at every level in terms of the sounds that are used and of course whether we use gestures or words um sort of ver, 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 um, oral speech um these these things that you know there's the very every very way you look there's variation and these languages all seem to work you know pretty much equivalently from a functional point of view which is amazing but um but, and, but were it not the case of course the selection of pressures would have would have operated i have a couple of questions that are specific uh, to each of you this is uh, somewhat interesting one is uh danish language for morton i i see that you have looked at it uh more specifically in some ways uh where does danish fall into all the languages and what have you looked at it about well on the one hand sort of danish is you know a, a garden variety european language so you know for many people it's not particularly interesting. However, once you delve into it, and of course, I'm, I'm slightly biased there because I, I am a native Dane, as it were, so I speak Danish. But, but one of the interesting thing is that for a long time, people have acknowledged that Danish is very difficult to learn as a second language. Um, but what we found out in some work I've been doing with a number of colleagues in Denmark is that Danish children too have problems learning their native language. And from the viewpoint of, say, universal grammar or something like that, there should be no difference across languages in how easy they are to, to learn and use because they all follow a, the same pattern. But if you look at languages as sort of evolving by way of cultural evolution, then it's possible that some languages might, at least for some time, end up in a suboptimal part of the a space of possibilities for different languages. And it seems that Danish, because Danish has a very uh, opaque sound structure, um, there's a lot of vowels, 
um, there's a tendency to turn some consonants into vowel-like sounds. And then there's a tendency to sort of swallow the ends of words. So about you, you should give us some ex- you should give us some examples. In, in That'd re- be great. Well, I can say brain. if I wanted to say I'm out on a desert island, <laughs> <laughs> There's several words there. I just want you to absolutely continue. baffling. <laughs> and and so what happens is that because the sound is so opaque, it's difficult for children actually to figure out where words begin and end, just like you probably couldn't figure out where the words were and what I just said in Danish. And that slows them down. So uh, even compared to children learning Norwegian, which is a very closely related language, you know, the societies are very similar, similar educational system, it is similar grammar, similar vocabulary, but in Norwegian, they actually produce their consonants. But in Danish, many times we don't, as, as you probably could, could hear. And, and so that delays children. So they're, uh, they're behind in terms of vocabulary acquisition. They also about, they learn the past tense in Danish about two years later than uh, their peers from Norway or Sweden. And then we looked at as adults that, that this, this difficulties during acquisition changes how adults too process their native language. They seem to rely more on context because the the input, the speech is so ambiguous so that I have to rely more on trying to figure out what I think you might be saying, um, what we talked about before and all sort of things. So for Danes, it's a little bit like playing charades in a darkened room. You have to do much more guessing to figure out what's going on. Um, And so what that suggests is that not all languages are the same. They're not built from the same sort of cloth, so to speak, but rather each language will differ in how we learn and process it. And that change, that means that the way our brains end up looking will be subtly different uh, for each of these languages. And again, that kind of counters from a different perspective, this notion that we all have this building grammar that leads us to the same set of, the same ways of using and learning language. And that's why I find Danish so fascinating, not just because I'm Danish. <laughs> that's, I've thought about this, that such that maybe a person who learns a certain language, it actually affects a, a little bit of their life direction, a little bit of maybe personality, a little bit of um, like, I don't know, risk taking or I, all the elements of what we are. There might be some link there. I'm not sure 100%, but I've thought about that before. Interesting one. Now. Uh, this one to Nick, I wanted to relate to, is there elements of the mind is flat that are related to the language game in any way? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. I mean, the, 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 the work that Morton and I have, have been doing, of course, predates the mind is flat by a long way. So we've been working on this, uh, these kinds of ideas, though they've changed over, the t- over time for, as Morton says, about 30 years. Um, but one strand of that thinking, which very much is the, the charade strand, is this idea that we're improvisers. So the idea that we're generating language in the moment on the fly, and that's the primary um, the primary sort of datum really, of, is that how do people do this? And that's, that's the primary challenge. Um, I think that that's very much aligns with the, the mind is flat perspective, which is saying that, that um, the mind is this sort of relentless, improviser, a generator of explanations and, and justifications for our behavior, um, but it's doing it in the moment. Um, and if you say, so, uh, so, that's, so one connection is that in a way, the, the, we're tricked, uh, the, the amazing facility we have with language sort of tricks us into thinking um, that we're, we're reporting on a sort of deep, a deep and fully stable inner world. Um, but we're actually just, you know, we're, we're amazing, amazingly able to improvise stories, um, but we're doing it post hoc. But there's another connection as well, and I think, I mean, the, the, the ideas in the mind is flat, I'm sure, are very influenced by the discussion more than I've been having over the years. Um, and the, the, in this regard, so the idea that grammar um, is a sort of underlying deep, deep theory of how languages work, and the child has got to figure out what this theory is, that's a particularly clear and actually particularly influential example of a much more general idea in cognitive science, um, which is that, for example, if you're a, a child learning mathematics, you've got to learns the sort of underlying principles of mathematics from the sort of scraps of experience and uh, that you, you encounter in bits of teaching. And if you're learning the, how the physical world works, you've got to learn a theory too. So this idea that there are these underlying theories, which grammar is one, that, it, that, that drive our behavior. 
And I think that uh, just to, in just the same way that the, gra the grammar story doesn't work really very well, I think the theory story generally doesn't work. So the, the truth is that the, the way we uh, interact with the physical world, the way we interact with the mathematical world is much more instance-based and case-based than that. So we think, oh, I, I recognize this formula. I think you're supposed to do this. So I, I seem to remember you can you know, move this to the other side of the equation and put a minus in. I think that seems to work. And we have this, and we have that understanding of the physical world too. I, 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 I don't really understand how electricity works, but I kind of understand various interactions I can have with the electrical things around my house. And, and of course, you can, if you try to give me a, get me to give you a theory, um, I'll try. I think, oh yeah, I think, I think it'll make sense. There's a kind of theory, there's electrons going along. And if you try and probe me, of course, the theory will crack up because I don't really know what's going on. And I think that's that general idea that we have this feeling that there's the core of intelligence must be these deep, coherent, very abstract theories. But actually, the secret of good improvisation is very local. It's this, this kind of, you figure, figure the world out case by case and generalize case by case. And it's just as well, because the, th the world is too complex to have theories about and language is too complex to have theories about. You know, they're trying to build the, the theory with this kind of endless and, ho and a hopeless task. So we're, what, what makes us special is our amazing creative improvisational abilities. Has some elements of Occam's razor of going toward the simplest item. Yeah. One thing that I wanted to add in uh, quite a few times, child learning of language was mentioned. Uh, can you speak on that? Um, actually, both of you, if, if applicable, on why is that? Is that so different? Is the adult space not relevant? Is it five times as hard for an adult to pick up language as a child? Is language really geared towards first years? Can you speak on that? So I think there's, a, there's a, at least a couple of things that are relevant there. So on the one hand, um, the notion that languages themselves have been adapted to our brains, uh, once we take that into account, they have of course been adapted specifically for children at some level. So they've been, they've been adapted to be learnable by children as such. And of course, as adults, you know, we have much more experience with the world, our brains have changed and so on. So that's part of the reason. Another important thing that I think is often overlooked when we, when we talk about how, how it's harder to learn a second language, say in high school or later in life. And that is that when you're a child learning a language, that is your job. That is one of your main jobs. You spend so much time sort of trying to, listening to adults around you or other kids, trying to figure out how, how it works, you know, how to say things and so on, how to use it in the moment. Um, and that, that is a huge part of what children do early on. But as adults, like if you're learning it say in high school or if you're learning it, you know, in some of the evening class or something like that, that's just a tiny chunk of your time you put into this. And it's not as important to you for, as for the child. The child is trying to figure out what are these noises that these adults around them are using? How can I try to make myself understood? And, and so it becomes crucially important for that child to be able to use language and to pick up on these patterns that we use in order to communicate with one another. But if you're learning, say, French in an evening class, then yes, you want to learn it because maybe you're going to France, maybe you're going to somewhere when they speak French, but it's not going to be as important for you in the moment as it is for a child. So I think there's, there's differences in motivation. And then, of course, also another thing that, that um, is also, also often overlooked as well is that once, once we learn our native language or languages, we become really good at it. And so we become really good at dealing with the sounds of our native language, with the ways in which we sort of kind of group words together to the kind of patterns that are relevant for that language. And those kind of processes oftentimes don't work very well for other languages. So the fact that we become experts in our native languages actually makes it harder to pick up on other languages because the kind of patterns that we're used to using and the particular kind of things that work really well, say for English, may not work that well for Chinese. And thus we have to overcome that. And that's much harder. Whereas when you're a child, even if you're learning multiple languages, you haven't really sort of fixed into these patterns yet. So they're malleable enough so that you can accommodate multiple languages at the same time. So these are some of the factors that, that I think from a, the kind of perspective that we lay out in the book can help explain why it's harder to learn a language as adult compared to when you're a child. It's a great comparison there. It's nice to learn languages and I see a future where we can connect uh, 
with more individuals of different languages. On this one, uh, could you each provide a closing point on what you would want individuals to take from the book? I will start with Nick. Uh, well, I think people should be amazed but the, uh, the, of the astonishing um, human achievement that language is. I mean, we take it for granted or often take it for granted, but really it's spectacular. It's probably our most important invention. invention. Um, it, we have intuitively little conception of just how remarkable it is that each of us manages to pick this thing up and manipulate it and use it and use it to guide, guide our lives. Um, but also as a collective society, we've, we've built in all these extraordinary subtle distinctions of meaning um, which allow us to, to navigate just such, you know, such complex, complex aspects of science, mathematics, law, um, subtle social relationships. I mean, it's just this most spectacular, most, spect most spectacular feat. And of course, once we've done that, that allows us, as Morton was saying earlier, to then build so much, build, build such rich, rich cultures on top of it. So I think having an appreciation of just how amazing it is that, that we've done this. And may, we don't know if there are any other creatures in the universe who have, maybe there are lots, um, but it is a spectacular thing to have, have been able to, 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 to actually um, create such a rich communicative system. That's true. Just, just to add to that, so I think, I mean, this, this is very much what I'm thinking as well. And I, but I think in, in addition to that, I also feel that the book has a very positive message in the notion that language is fundamentally collaborative. And I think sort of looking forward, if we can sort of return to that notion that what language is for is for collaboration, is for interacting with one another, um, then that maybe can help us to overcome some of the kind of the problems that we are facing uh, going forward. And, and, and even if we think something like fake news, fake news only works because we tend to trust each other when we are communicating. So part of what language is built on is trust that when I'm saying something, you can sort of assume that I'm trying to, what I'm trying to tell you is, you know, what I think is correct for all intents and purposes. And of course, so when we come across fake news, we might take that for granted unless we're able to um, sort of figure out that it's not in some way. But I think overall, the fact that language is so, um, it's such a collaborative a tool that we have, that is a, a sort of a positive message that maybe can help us get together and sort of move forward in a, in a more peaceful world. Of course, right now it's not as peaceful as it could have been. But I, but I think ultimately in the future, if we are gonna overcome all of this, language will be a crucial part of that. I just have to throw in this one, just came to my mind also just to add in, is there such a thing that maybe 10 years from now we'll be able to speak to individuals in German or wherever through some sort of automatic translation that will be smooth? Any thoughts on that? I think, I mean, the answer is we're not, I don't think we're that far away from doing that, but not necessarily very perfectly. So I think, um, yeah, the, the text, the, the sort of going from speech to essentially abstract text and back is now pretty good and translating is pretty good when you look at the sort of effects of work, the you know, kind of achievements of Google and similar, um, sim similar teams. It's, it's pretty remarkable. Um, it's not going to be perfect. It's always going to be making mistakes because it doesn't have this, this charade-like understanding that, that humans have. So if you're trying to converse, I think the tricky thing is so, so having a, a kind of abstract conversation about something um, over, a, 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 we're over a telephone, that might work quite well. Well, it's going to be very difficult, and I don't think we have the technology or understanding how to do this at all, is how to essentially have a chat. Um, so we're having a chat where all the action is the people we know to, in common, the things with, the, just, the thing that's wandered, wandered by into our field of view, all of this informal stuff where all the context is doing all the work. Then, then the machine learning approach, which is basically to working by vast amounts of data, which are not context specific, then that becomes very difficult. Um, so I think having something a bit equivalent to um, sort of uh, exchanging speeches, I think we'll be able to do that pretty well. But I think trying to have, have, a, have, have a genuine, um, warm uh, conversational interactions with each other, that's very hard. I don't see any, any prospect of that anytime soon. Fair point. I had to add that one in. I have many questions, but uh, this is wonderful information for all. I would like to mention The Language Game is the name of the book. And Professor Morton H. Christensen and Professor Nick Chaita, I want to thank you both for joining on this episode and sharing a wealth of information with all of us. Thank you so much, Armin. It's been a real pleasure. Great fun. Wonderful. And we are out. <laughs>